talking about a whole range of issues that have to do with sexual assault and coercion. And we're going to be focusing on adolescence. So I'm going to get started with a quote that is from a 17-year-old girl. And what she says is, I've been the victim of sexual, physical, verbal, and emotional abuse. We aren't together anymore, but the damage is huge. I can't seem to get over the pain that he's caused me. I feel used, not good enough, taken advantage of. And the reason I chose that quote is that, it, first of all, it shows that there's a whole range of different kinds of abuse that may occur together. And the other is that it has consequences that may go on for a very long period of time. So I, I thought that that was very important. The focus of this presentation is going to be on advocacy. And I know we have a variety of people from different disciplines who have joined us today. And I'm using advocacy in the broadest possible sense. You may be a sexual assault advocate. You may be a domestic violence advocate. But you may also be a therapist. You may be somebody who works for the court. You may be a teacher who works with teenagers. But if you see yourself as someone who advocates for safety and uh, a, a good relationship for teenagers, a healthy relationship for teenagers, then I think that you're going to find the tips and the things that we're talking about to be helpful. I do want to tell you that we're going to be talking for about an hour and then we're going to have a 15-minute question and answer period. And obviously, this is not going to be a comprehensive view of sexual assault and coercion in one hour. That's just not possible to do. There's huge <laughs> uh, amounts of information and materials out there. What I'm trying to do is to present some highlights to get you thinking about some things and to offer as many resources as I possibly can. So let's talk about what we're trying to do today. We want to, at the end of this time, I hope that you'll be able to describe the prevalence and dynamics of adolescent intimate partner sexual violence, that you will be able to feel comfortable in knowing that how widespread this is and how it actually works. I hope that you're going to have a number of advocacy strategies that you'll have in your toolbox now, and I've called those out on the slides very specifically and you'll have to figure out which ones work for you in your setting, but I hope that that's going to be useful for you. And I would want you to be able to have a, a huge number of resources available that you can explore at your leisure. When the webinar is over, we will be sending you a copy of the slides, and you will also get a resource sheet, so you'll have that available to you. And that resource sheet, again, is not comprehensive, but it'll cover the resources that I actually mentioned during the webinar. So let's talk about what we're calling this phenomenon. And a lot of times you hear the term teen dating violence. Teen dating violence is, well, it's Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, right? It's February. Um, but there's problems with calling it teen dating violence. It doesn't really do it. For one thing, if you've talked to teenagers lately, they don't call it dating. Dating is kind of a word for my generation. I'm a little bit older than a teenager. So that doesn't always fit for them. The other thing is when you say teen dating violence, people think of physical violence, which may or may not be a component of the sexual violence. And so they may not be thinking of sexual coercion and all the other things that go along with that. So it's hard to find the right term. I, I sometimes uh, use the term teen relationship abuse, and that can, can work possibly. I'd be interested to hear from you all about what you might call it and what you think that teens themselves would feel comfortable with. But in terms of how to approach this when you're actually working with teenagers, the best possible thing to do is to ask them. Unless you are very close to your teens yourself, uh, I mean to your teen years, you're going to be using different language than teenagers do. Things move pretty rapidly in terms of terminology. And there are regional differences. So uh, don't make assumptions. For example, I use the example of the term hooking up. Some people use that to mean just getting together. Some people use it to mean actually having sex with somebody. So don't assume what a teenager means without asking him or her. So this next slide talks some about the overlap of sexual violence and domestic violence into what we call intimate partner sexual violence. 
and intimate partner sexual violence is really both sexual violence and domestic violence. It's anything that happens between intimate partners that makes a person feel uncomfortable and is done for the purpose of controlling that person, okay? Now, it doesn't necessarily have to include violence right at the time. There may not be physical force that's used during the episode of sexual violence, for example, and in fact, the entire relationship may or may not include episodes of physical violence, but there is fear, there's threats, there's coercion, there's manipulation, all of those things. And that term intimate partner sexual violence is used for victims of all ages. It's not just talking about teenagers. Now, I'll use the term victim and survivor uh, somewhat interchangeably during this. I don't really prefer the term victim, but we use that because often that's the language of, of grants or of, um, of some of the work that we do. And when someone has just recently been victimized, I think sometimes it's important to use the word victim just because it reinforces the fact that a crime has been committed and that something devastating has happened to that individual as people go on in their lives and we call them survivors. So if you work in an agency that is just concerned with sexual violence or just concerned with domestic violence, for example, one of the things that I strongly suggest is that you partner with someone who's from the other side of the corridor there and uh, that you look for resources that have to do with both sexual violence and physical violence because this form of violence does include both. When we're talking about what is actually happening in teen relationships, there's a wide variety of things that may happen. The sexual harassment is sometimes looked at as something minor, but it, it really isn't. It's part of that really ugly continuum uh, in which one partner tries to dominate and control the other partner by putting them down sexually, by threatening them sexually, um, and of course, in this day and age, there are many more venues for doing that, online venues, uh, using sexting, other ways that a person could exert power and control verbally in the relationship. And sexual coercion may be verbal, but it, it can extend into the physical as well. It's the result of a power imbalance. And very often, the person who's being coerced doesn't see it necessarily as coercion. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, about the dynamics there. And then, of course, it's pretty clear cut when you get into the sexual assault dynamic. Any kind of sexual contact without consent is sexual assault. Uh, but once again, the people who are victimized may not use those terms. So let's talk first of all about what's necessary for consent in a relationship because we have to look at what's healthy and what what you would want to see happen in a relationship before we can talk about violence and coercion. So I came up with this little acronym, and you'll have to forgive me because it winds up spelling the word HERS, so I had to include and in his too because this isn't necessarily limited to either men or women or boys or girls in the case of younger teens. So. Talking about what's necessary for consent in a relationship, the honesty issue, I think, is a critical one because when someone is being sexually coerced, very often there's a grooming process that goes on um, and people use emotions in a way to manipulate the other person. For example, um, telling someone that you love them, uh, telling somebody that... Um, that you're going to be with them, all of those kinds of things that people use in order to coerce a sexual relationship. I just read a very interesting study on monogamy. It was actually done with young adults. And I almost had to laugh because what they did was they asked couples whether they were in a monogamous relationship, whether they had an agreement to be in a monogamous relationship or not. And what they found was that in the same couple, very often, one partner said, oh, yes, we have an agreement to be in a monogamous relationship, and the other partner said, oh, no, we don't have any such agreement. And then even among the couples who, who agreed that they had an agreement, who both said that they had an agreement to be monogamous, very often they weren't. Uh, very often one or the other of them 
was not faithful to the other. So the communication and the honesty is a really important part of consent. Um, honesty about a person's sexual history, honesty about their motivations, and honesty about what each partner wants within the relationship, I think is a necessary part of having true consent in a relationship. And there's the equity factor. And, you know, if two adults get together and one of them is 40 and the other one is 47, I don't think any of us thinks that that is necessarily going to be a, a badly balanced relationship. But if a 12-year-old and a 19-year-old get together, there's unlikely to be a great deal of equity in that relationship. So power changes within the relationship, power differentials within the relationship may happen because of age, they may happen because of economic status. Maybe one partner has more money and, and uses that as leverage. Um, experience, even if one partner is younger than the other, if they're more experienced, more worldly, then it may not be a level playing field. Decision-making ability. And then, of course, there are some teens who are vulnerable teens for a variety of reasons, uh, because of developmental disabilities or because of other factors that make it harder for them to to be on a peer-to-peer -peer basis with their relationship partner. The respect one I think is, is pretty clear cut, but that's, I put that in there because I think that's a great discussion item with teens is to talk about what does it mean when someone respects you? How do they show they respect you? Um, under what circumstances do you know that, it's, that they're gonna respect you if you choose not to do something, even if you've done it before? How, how do you know that it's okay to say no within a relationship? And then the, the safety issue has to do with a variety of kinds of safety. You can't truly consent to something if you don't feel safe. So if you're afraid, if you've been threatened, if you don't think that your physical safety is going to be okay or your emotional safety is going to be okay, if you say no, then you can't freely consent. And the, the safety portion also includes sobriety because alcohol and drugs have been shown to be a factor in all sorts of teen sexual assault. There is a, a lot of information about how that plays out within an intimate relationship, within a partnership of teens who say that they're together. Um, there's one study that does mention the fact that teens who are in a casual relationship may more often have alcohol or drug facilitated sexual assault or coercion than teens who are in a long-term relationship, a committed relationship of some sort. So, and, and the other part of safety is being safe from ridicule and shaming because those are major threats to teenagers in particular. So we want to talk some about what sexual coercion is. Sexual coercion essentially is pressure to do something sexually that you're not comfortable doing. And it may take the form of, of verbal harassment, as we talked about, or threats, and it, or it may actually go as far as physical forcing. It also may apply to just one specific thing that's happening within the relationship, or it can be part of a whole continuing sexual relationship that's coerced. Um, when a person... I, I kind of hate this term give in, gives into coercion because that implies a little more choice than a person may have. But when a person does succumb to that coercion, then a lot of times they feel like they're complicit. They feel as though, um, as though they have agreed to something even though the, the person who is coerced may not feel that they have the freedom to say no. So it's very complicated, and some of the dynamics there are similar to the dynamics in child sexual abuse, where the survivor of child sexual abuse often feels that he or she is complicit, feels that uh, he or she should have said no or should have done something different, even though under the circumstances that's not realistic. And that's sometimes the case in teen coercion as well. The coercion can come not just from the partner, but it can also come from all the expectations that we have around teen relationships and teen dating, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, about what we expect. So here's, here's a tough thing. If you're working with a teen 
And for example, let's say you're working with a very young teen who is uh, dating someone who's considerably older and is feeling some pressure sexually, but doesn't really define that as coercion and feels that um, adults don't really understand what's going on. You know, they're, they're madly in love with this much older person, for example. If you barge in there, so to speak, and, and talk about it from your perspective, you're going to lose the teen. You're going to lose that communication. You're going to lose that relationship. I think as an advocacy strategy, questions are the most important thing here as opposed to telling someone what the nature of that relationship is, but asking pointed questions so that a person can think about what is going on in this relationship. Do I have the freedom to choose? Am I being pressured in a way that I don't like? Um, is, is it okay for me to say no? And do I feel like I have equal power with my partner? Um, now, it's complicated with teens because at what point does one teenager persuading the other teenager to do something sexual that they may be reluctant to do become sexual coercion? I mean, that happens all the time. Anybody who remembers being a teenager will remember that uh, that's one of the things that happens in teen relationships, that one partner is often more ready for sexual activity, more interested in sexual activity, and is trying to persuade the other person. But if you don't have those elements of consent that we talked about a moment ago, if you don't have that, the honesty, if you don't have the equity, if you don't have the respect, and you don't have the safety, then that can easily go from just, oh, he or she wants it and the other person doesn't, to an actual coercive experience. Um, young teens may be very confused about what they want and conflicted about what they want in a relationship. Often they want adult status, they want to feel like an adult, and it may be difficult for them to give clear messages. However, we need to not chalk up all of these kinds of incidents to miscommunication. I think that that's often an easy out for explaining what happens in really very coercive relationships is to talk about it as, well, you know, it's just poor communication, they're confused, or they were drinking, or whatever it is. There are situations where that happens, but there are also situations where someone is targeted, groomed, and clearly the object of a, of a, a predatory kind of approach. And that's where looking at the entire relationship and looking at the power and control issues in the relationship is most important. If you want to have a way to get into the, the head of the teenagers who are trying to make these decisions, there's a great interactive activity that the that our sister coalition, the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, has developed. It's called In Their Shoes. Uh, some of you have probably heard of the interactive activity called In Her Shoes, which helps people understand what adult survivors of domestic violence go through. In Their Shoes is a similar simulation activity that is um, for adults who want to understand what it's like to be a teenager and what it's like to be a teenager in a relationship where there may be physical or sexual abuse or coercion. And I strongly recommend that. It's a very interesting thing. You can go to the website of the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence to look for that. So let's take a look at abusive teen relationships. And we've already talked about respect being necessary for consent. So if, if you think about what an abusive relationship looks like, it often doesn't take very long to, to figure out from the way that, that young people speak to each other that there's a lack of respect. Um, the verbal abuse and verbal put-downs, you know, kids will sometimes do that back and forth as a way of joking with each other, and it's, it's not serious. But this, I'm talking about something very different here. I'm talking about something that's really demeaning to the individual. When I'm talking about disregard for privacy, it's not just listening in on conversations anymore. It's maybe getting someone's passwords, going into their Facebook account, going and, and changing things, uh, looking at their text messages without permission, all of the kinds of technological invasions of privacy that are possible these days, as well as going into the stalking realm of following somebody or um, trying to get information about them that they're not willing to share freely. 
as in other kinds of abusive relationships, teens can get very isolated from their friends. You know, and some of that happens naturally in a teen dating relationship. When you're first in love, the only person you want to be with is your partner. You know, you're not so interested in your other friends. And that's a normal part of teen dating and teen relationships. But if it continues over a period of time, and especially if one of the partners deliberately uh, sets a boundary and says, no, I don't want you hanging out with, with those friends, uh, that's something that is part of the dynamic of power and control. Very often, teens' parents do not know that they are in abusive relationships. Um, if you think back to your own teen years, you probably did not share every detail of your friendships or your relationships with your parents, and teenagers today are no different in that. However, they have some tools that make it more likely that they're going to be able to hide the nature of their relationship from their families. And both the, the victim and the perpetrator may be hiding this because people who are being victimized in relationships don't want their family to know, especially if the family's been disapproving of the partner from the beginning. You know, it's very, very important to teens to maintain their freedom. And if they admit that they're in an abusive relationship, then they know that their freedom, that their parents may be looking over their shoulder a great deal more, and most teens don't want that. And in addition, they have a cell phone, which makes a lot of the communication between partners hidden from parents. Uh, I'm so old that we had a telephone in, in the front hall of my house, and we were limited to five-minute calls, and everybody in the house could hear everything you said while you were on the telephone. And so there wasn't a great deal of privacy on the telephone then. It's very different now. And kids are text messaging each other at 3 o'clock in the morning, and parents have no idea that that's going on. And that leads into what I call the electronic leash, which is someone who is controlling of their partner now has the technological means to, to really try to monitor their every move. Where are they? Where are they going? Who are they with? And sometimes to the extent of thousands of text messages, messages a day and becoming very angry if the person doesn't answer. And so you may have someone, you may have a teenager who is frightened not to answer their cell phone and frightened not to return messages because they are afraid that their partner is going to become angry. Physical violence is certainly present in teen dating relationships and it may be part of this picture, this intimate partner sexual violence picture. We've talked about sexual coercion, and, you know, I, I started to put sex without consent there, but I had to put equal sexual assault because that's, that's what sexual assault is. And then alcohol and drugs certainly make it easier for there to be, um, for people not to be able to feel that they can freely make decisions. And in addition to that, if someone is being victimized while they're under the influence of alcohol and drugs, they may be even less willing to reveal that to a parent or to another adult because they're afraid that they're going to get in trouble. I do have an activity that you'll get on your resource sheet at the end of, the, of this webinar called the Continuum of Teen Sexual Violence. And that's an activity you can use either with teenagers or with people who work with teenagers. You can use it in prevention or you could use it in support groups. And what it does is it talks about specific situations between teens and then asks uh, whoever's participating in the activity to decide whether it's something that constitutes sexual violence or coercion, whether it's something that's really okay, or whether it's something that's not okay, but it doesn't rise to the level of sexual coercion um, or violence. And it's a really, really interesting activity to do because it makes people think things through in a different way than they have before. So who is affected? One, one of the things when we asked people what some of their interests and concerns were coming into the webinar, people said, are you going to talk about males and females and are you going to talk about victims and perpetrators? And we have to look at the fact that sexual coercion, although the, the majority of perpetrators of sexual coercion are male, not all of them are, and that it can go in both directions. Um, that there certainly are teenage boys who feel coerced and pressured into sexual relationships, and as well as girls who are coerced and pressured into sexual relationships. 
in addition, it's really important not to overlook youth who are in same-sex relationships. And, and these young people tend to be really highly vulnerable because they, they don't feel like they have support. Often they're not able to talk to their family about what's going on in their relationship. They may not be able to talk to their friends. They may not feel that they can talk to other adults, depending on where they are and in what circumstances. And so uh, there's a lot of vulnerability for young people who are in same-sex relationships. We need to be really aware that this can happen to young people of all ages. Um, tweens, that, that's kind of a weird term, but it's been used in a bunch of different studies, and in many studies it's defined as young people from 11 to 14 because they are kind of in a different uh, place in their lives than older, older people who may be in high school. Usually these are middle school or junior high school age young people. And the very young tweens may very well be uh, part of this this picture. And then when we're looking at who's affected, we have to keep in our mind that, that people are coming from all sorts of communities, and homeless youth in particular are very, um, very vulnerable to sexual coercion. Often when young people are homeless, they will be uh, in a relationship with somebody because they see that as a path to survival and sex is a necessary condition of that. And they may or may not initially see that as an abusive or exploitative relationship, but very often it, it is. Um, so just an interesting statistic, there is a, a survey that was done in 2007 called the Oregon Healthy Teens Survey. and. This was a group of 11th graders who answered the question, and the question was, have you ever given in to sexual activity when you didn't want to because of pressure? And uh, 24, I'm sorry, 21.4% of females said yes to that question, and 6.7% of males said yes to that question. So the question is, have you ever given in to sexual activity when you didn't want to because of pressure? Um, so nearly... Well, a little more than a fifth of the girls said yes, and close to 7% of the boys said yes. And these were 11th graders. So it does happen. Uh, once again, I want to make the point that it happens to both young men and young women, that it happens to very young tweens, and that it happens to folks from all sorts of communities. So... Let's think about why teens don't tell, why they don't tell parents, why they don't tell teachers, why they don't tell school counselors, why they don't tell anyone very often. Some of it has to do with confusion. It's pretty confusing to be a young person and to be in a relationship and to figure out what you want to do and what you don't want to do sexually and what the other person is asking you to do sexually. And so a lot of times it's, hard for a teen to decide is this coercion, is this something that shouldn't have happened or not. You know, many, many years ago there was a, a book called I Never Called It Rape, and it talked about how many, in this case young women, were victimized sexually and in their minds they didn't understand that this was a rape experience, even though it met the legal criteria for rape. And I think that's true for teen sexual assault as well especially in situations, for example, where a teenager um, has been drinking or in a situation where they have been sexually active with that partner prior to that and they say no to a particular act and they don't see it as sexual coercion or sexual assault when their partner goes ahead and forces that sexual act. Um, embarrassment is a prime reason why teens don't tell most people don't want to talk about their sex lives <laughs> to other people other than a, a very select few. And so just any kind of discussion of sexual issues may be embarrassing and certainly talking about um, really intimate details of something that is embarrassing is very, very tough for anyone, especially teens. I sort out shame differently from embarrassment because embarrassment is I'm going to feel bad if someone knows about this. Shame is if someone knows about this, 
they're going to be disgusted by me. If they really knew what I was like, then they would think I was a horrible and disgusting person. That's what the experience of shame is like. And often young people who have been victimized multiple times or who were victimized earlier in childhood have that sense of shame. They really feel that it, there's something wrong with them and it's not about the person who did this to them, but it's about their own, um, their own inadequacies. So that's a, a prime reason for not telling. The guilt may have to do with being somewhere they shouldn't be, with someone they shouldn't be with, um, at a time when they shouldn't be there. <laughs> Um, you know, teens are subject to adult uh, parental rules a lot of times, and very often when sexual assault or coercion happens, they've been breaking those rules. And so those things get mixed up in a young person's mind so that the fact that they were drinking or that they were at a friend's house when they weren't, when they weren't supposed to be there uh, makes them feel guilty and makes them feel that they're unable to talk about what happened in terms of the sexual assault or the sexual coercion. Many teens are, are really afraid of the person who's been coercive and, and for good reason. They're threatened. Um, there's a, an issue of physical violence and that fear makes it extremely tough to say what's going on. I think a big factor, particularly in teen relationships, is that they want to maintain the relationship. They don't want the person to be sexually abusive or coercive or physically abusive or coercive, but they don't want to give up the relationship. You know, teens may develop very, very strong emotional attachments, and as with anybody who's in an abusive relationship, there are mixed feelings at different times during the relationship. and so. Uh, they know, for example, that something bad may happen to the perpetrator if they tell that the person may go to jail or, or uh, that the person may be punished in some way, and they may not want that. They just want the abuse to stop. In addition, economic dependence may be a factor in the desire to maintain the relationship. You know, some teens are parents, and it may be their partner who has been the abuser, and so... Um, it's very hard to send the father of your children to jail, for example, and it's very hard if you're dependent on somebody for financial assistance and support to, to be uh, disclosing of the fact that they've been abusive. So when we look at a few of the facts, and I'm not going to go into vast detail about statistics because there are so many different statistics you can have with sexual violence in teens. But I do want to talk a little bit about the facts that we know. Um, we do know that teens who have a history of sexual abuse are five times more likely to report coercive sex with a friend or a date than their non-abused peers. So I don't think this is going to surprise anybody, but that someone who has a history of sexual abuse is more likely to have been vulnerable to being coerced into sex. In addition, there's some, some research that shows that teens with a history of sexual abuse are more likely to become the coercers, to become the abusers in that situation. Um, another fact that we know from some research is that among students who reported that they had sex before age 15, so young people who had sex up through the age of 14, uh, among those young people, 41.5% of females reported being forced to have sex compared to 5.5% of males. So early sexual activity is a high risk factor for sexual coercion in an intimate relationship. The longer that kids hold off having sex, the less likely they are to have been sexually coerced. Uh, there was a study in uh, of public high school students in Massachusetts and that's where uh, the figure one in five high school students has been victimized by physically or sexually by a dating partner has come up. And that, that statistic is also um, from the Journal of the American Medical Association study that was done several years ago. So again, one in five teens has, female teens has been physically or sexually abused. And also, 
uh, young women who've been sexually abused by a dating partner are more likely to have an unwanted pregnancy and they're more likely to have attempted suicide. So some of those things go together. In addition, in that study that we're talking about that um, talks about students with a history of sexual abuse, they also said that students who were ever forced to have sex didn't use condoms as much. And that, again, makes sense. Um, and that there were lower protective factors like their parents knowing what was going on. So I think the takeaway from this is that, that early sexual activity is related to sexual coercion and also to uh, less likelihood of using birth control. Um, we have a question that says, is there a higher percentage of young women of color who are victims of sexual coercion? And uh, the research is not that great on this, to be honest with you. Um, we do know that there is a relationship between reported sexual coercion and abuse and socioeconomic status. That uh, as socioeconomic status goes up, there are fewer reports of sexual assault and coercion. But uh, in terms of a racial breakdown, I don't have a statistic on that. Um, it would be interesting to see what people think from, from their own experience and from what they've read. One aspect of teen intimate partner sexual violence that's often overlooked is the, the role of gender and gender expectations in teen sexual coercion or sexual assault. When you think about what's expected of teenagers sexually, often girls are the ones who are supposed to say no, okay? They're, they're expected to be the sexual gatekeepers. And that kind of paradigm doesn't do anybody much good because it puts a lot of pressure on girls to be the ones to decide how much is enough and in what situation and in what relationship. Often when they don't have very much experience in, in any kind of relationship, they're supposed to be the ones who say yes or no. But they also get a mixed message about their role in society because they're also supposed to be popular and they're supposed to please boys. And so being able to do that while saying no to sexual activity in a culture that says that teenage girls are supposed to be very sexual, um, that's what our media tells us, is a very, very confusing role for young women. It's very hard for them to negotiate all of those competing expectations at once. Um, in addition, young men and boys are also penalized by these sexual expectations because the idea is that somehow boys are supposed to accept with open arms any offered sexual contact from anybody, which is really, once again, kind of ridiculous. Um, they're not supposed to say no. What happens to a young man? Let's say we have a, a young man who has just started high school and uh, a, another, an older girl in the high school has approached him and wants to have sex with him, and he really doesn't want to. He doesn't know her very well. He doesn't feel like he's ready to do that. What kind of social support is there going to be for him to say no thank you? Uh, it's very hard because the idea, the, the social norm, is that boys are supposed to want sex all the time with anybody. And, of course, that's not true, but if they refuse, they may be the target of ridicule, and they may also be pressured by the young woman in that situation. And if you talk to parents of teenage boys, they will often say that their sons are um, put in kind of awkward situations when someone approaches them and, and wants to start up a relationship and they're not interested in doing that. Another factor that that uh, we need to consider when we're looking at the role that, that gender expectation plays, gender expectations play is that LGBTQ youth may not want to seek help at all because the things that we talk about when we talk about dating violence don't apply to them. Um, you know, they feel that they're not being, that their situation is not being looked at when people are looking at what's involved in dating violence. Um, and we have someone on our chat who said that there's an assumption that if you're the same gender, that this doesn't happen, that there isn't such a thing as same-sex 
dating violence, but we know that there is, and that there, sexual coercion and sexual violence in same-sex relationships is occurs at about the same level as it does in heterosexual relationships. So in terms of what you can do, we're going to have some more specific suggestions for reaching that population as we go on. But in any kind of outreach that you do, please take the time to talk about gender roles and talk about what the media tells us about gender roles. That's actually a really great strategy for encouraging teens to start thinking and talking about uh, sexual consent and sexual expectations. If they don't do that, then they're missing a big piece of of the freedom to consent, which is to understand the pressures that are being applied to them, not just from their partner, but also from society at large. For example, um, if girls are devalued, if they don't have a boyfriend, then if they're in a relationship where a boy says, if you don't have sex with me, I'm, I'm going to break up with you, they're much more prone to feeling sexually coerced. And similarly, if boys feel as though they can't say no to a sexual encounter, then they're going to feel sexually coerced if someone comes on to them. So the general issue is a foundational piece in any kind of prevention, and it's really, really important in understanding why there is sexual coercion in teen relationships. So we know that teens are at high risk. Um, this is the population that's targeted for sexual violence. And we do know that intimate partners are the folks who often are the perpetrators. That, you know, the, the, we've certainly debunked the idea that sexual violence is a result of stranger attacks. That's very rarely the case. It's almost always someone that the person knows in some way. And it's more likely than not to be a, uh, an intimate partner. And if we look at the population of teenagers who are actually sexually assaulted, sexually victimized, that most of that is by dating partners or by someone that they know pretty well. Uh, and this is, this is a quote uh, about sexual victimization experienced by young women, and that most of it is perpetrated by dating partners or acquaintances. So if we're going to try to protect people, then we need to be talking about their dating relationships. I worked at a university for a number of years, and we used to talk to parents about safety for their students. And a lot of times they would ask about things like, you know, the typical things like we need to have more lights in the parking lot. Well, of course, that's a great idea. We should have more lights in the parking lot. But they very rarely talk to high school students who are about to go off to college and talk to them about their dating relationships and the safety that they might have within their dating relationships. And that's where the danger is, not so much walking across a dark campus, but being in a relationship with someone who is exploitative. So we know that teens are at high risk. We know that most teen sexual violence occurs in the context of intimate partner sexual, intimate partner relationships. And now what we know is that, that young teens are really, really vulnerable. Now remember we defined tweens as 11 to 14 year olds. And the Liz Claiborne Foundation did a study called the Tween and Teen Dating Violence and Abuse Study, which is really interesting reading if you haven't seen it. That'll be on your resource sheet. What they found was that almost half of the tweens, the 11 to 14 year olds, and as many as a third of the 11 to 12 year olds say that they've been in a boyfriend girlfriend relationship. Now, of course, you have to ask young people what do they actually mean by that. You know, maybe they mean that they said hello in the hallway at school, but maybe they mean that they had oral sex behind the gym. So, what what's going on in these dating relationships is varies tremendously. But very young kids are interested in dating relationships. Very young kids are feeling the pressure to be in a dating relationship, and very young kids are very, very vulnerable. So nearly three in four of these young teens say that dating relationships do begin by age 14. <coughs> Excuse me. I think that's one of the reasons why we have to engage parents in prevention efforts. 
and why we really have to listen and talk to younger teens when they talk about having boyfriends or girlfriends and talk about what that means to them. A lot of times I think it's kind of dismissed, like, isn't that cute when a 12-year-old says that he or she has a, a dating relationship, but it may not be so cute. It may actually be an abusive relationship, and it may be with someone who's quite a bit older, which is a red flag for the possibility of coercion. So in this was Claiborne's study, they looked at the teens who had had sex before the age of 14 and found that 69% of them had experienced some relationship abuse. That's a pretty huge percentage. 36% of them felt that they were pressured into oral sex and 34% were pressured into intercourse. Um, now this doesn't mean that you want to run into classrooms with young people and immediately start talking about sexual coercion. This is where skill building on healthy relationships needs to start at a very young age. <coughs> Excuse me. And our prevention efforts need to focus on young teens. We can't start when kids are 16 years old to be talking about teen sexual violence in relationships. That's just ridiculous because many of them are already veterans of uh, violent relationships by the time they get to be 16. Uh, an effective strategy is to have older students, high school students or college students, present to younger students. You know, the, the younger students are much more likely to look up to and listen to older high school students or college students. They are much cooler than we are as adults. And so that's something that you might want to consider if that's something you can work into your own program. And a comprehensive sex education program is something that I think all young teens need to have because, because sexuality is confusing. And the more you know and understand about sexuality, the more likely you are to be able to make good decisions. And, the, and this applies not only to preventing victimization, but also to preventing perpetration. Because if someone, if a young person hasn't really talked about and thought about the issue of consent, they may have very confused ideas of what consent is and when it's okay to press ahead with something and when it's not. So this is not just for preventing someone from becoming vulnerable and being victimized, but it's also for preventing people from, young people from feeling that it's okay in some way to pressure a dating partner into something sexual that they're not ready for, they don't want to do. So teens live in a slightly different world than older folks do. And if you're working with teens around issues of sexual coercion, you have to become an expert in teen culture to some extent. Uh, teens get this bizarre hodgepodge of messages from the media about how they should be sexual, how they should express themselves sexually, how important it is to be in relationships, how, how they should dress and how they should talk. And yet at the same time, they're getting this message, don't have sex from their parents or from their teachers or from other adults. How they can put that together, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm kind of glad that my own children are, are beyond the teenage stage, and they they went through uh, the teenage stage when things were not quite so difficult to sort out. We've talked about the fact that boys and girls get very, very different messages about what's appropriate sexually, and that uh, LGBTQ kids get almost no relevant information. Um, so it's important to use the, the materials and the media that teens are interested in in order to communicate. Uh, in our resource sheet, we have a, a link to a publication, that, uh, a Wixap publication on um, helping kids to become media savvy. I think that's really, really critical. They need to become critical thinkers about the messages that the media is pushing at them and hopefully to become producers of good media as opposed to consumers of really distorted images and messages from media that, that um, objectifies teens. Uh, there's also there's a great 
DVD, as some of you have probably seen, called Straight Laced, and I believe that's on the resource sheet as well. It talks about expectations that kids have uh, for each other and that society has about their gender roles. It's really excellent, and it, it's a great conversation starter with young folks and with adults as well. Um, we're lucky because there are some teen-generated materials. The websites that I mentioned here, That's Not Cool and The Thin Line, actually have scenarios and conversations that are generated by teens that can become wonderful springboards for conversations because they're in the actual words of teens, they're real situations, and they're relevant to what young people are, are actually looking at and um, the format is something that is appealing to young folks. And this ties into the idea that technology is a native language for a lot of teenagers and not so much for, for some of us who may be a bit older, so we have to learn to speak that language. Um, we've talked about the fact that Teen relationship partners often hide their hide what's going on from their parents, um, and that there are all sorts of new forms of coercion that are a little bit beyond our scope today. But there's electronic stalking, there's GPS tracking of people, um, and yet at the same time, these new technologies are a way for us to inform ourselves about what's going on in the world of teens, and also to talk to teens in a language that they're comfortable with and that is meaningful to them. So uh, it's really important when you're talking to teens who may have been victimized to ask them about what form that, that takes. Are they still getting calls? Are they still getting text messages? Uh, is somebody hacking their Facebook page? And helping them to figure out how to handle what they want to do and what they don't want to do as relationships break up, for example, because that's often a time when, when young people are very vulnerable. And parents need to know what's going on with their kids. They need to have a way to get into that world so that they can talk about it, and so that, especially for younger teens, that they can provide some safeguards. As we work with teens, those of us who are more, who have more experience in working with adults, really have to look at some of the things that are specific to working with teens around sexual coercion and sexual assault. Uh, every state has different laws about mandated reporting. Some, in some states, advocates are mandated reporters, and in some states, they aren't. That's something where you want to know your own, policy, your own policies and the laws of your state. Um, you also really want to understand what the consent laws are in your state, because those vary. And there's a great booklet that was developed by uh, Partners in Prevention Education. It's on, on your resource sheet also. Um, the acronym is SCAR, Sexual Consent and Rape Laws, or something like that. And what they did was a bunch of young people got together and looked at all those laws in Washington and what those actually mean for young people in terms of at what age it's not acceptable in law to be in a sexual relationship with somebody. So that's something that you want to be familiar with. You want to be familiar with the difference between protective orders that might have to do with adults and with young people and to look at school policies. Okay. When, we, when we're working with teens, we're also working with families in one way or another. And about 75% of parents say that they've talked to teens about healthy relationships, but only about a quarter of their sons and about a third of their daughters said that those conversations had happened. So there's a communication disconnect there. Um, a lot of parents think that they know what to talk about, but they really don't. So the more that you can do in terms of working with parents, and again, we have some resources for you on that, the more that parents are going to feel confident in talking to teens in a general way and early and often, we hope, about what abusive relationships are and how how they can avoid becoming either perpetrators or victims in those relationships. Um, and then if something does happen, what they can do and the fact that parents can be approachable about it. Teens are also obviously in the school setting. And 
in the school setting, um, we have the opportunity to approach teens and to offer prevention materials. We also need to recognize that abuse happens on campus and that teens are uh, in a kind of a, a stew of social messages in school that they really have to have a way to sort out. There are so many opportunities to work with adults in the school system to provide a supportive safety net for young people that that's an opportunity we can't overlook. Um, most schools do need in-service training for their teachers and if you can be the person to offer that in-service training and you can talk about healthy relationships, which is a little bit less threatening sometimes than talking about sexual assault, but it gets to the same place, that's a great strategy for increasing the number of adults that teens come into contact with who can provide them with some sort of help. Now, the developmental issues that have to do with teens could take up an entire webinar, and we're almost out of time for this webinar, so we're not going to do that. But educating yourself about the ways in which young people think and about the fact that their brains are still developing. Um, is important if you're someone who's working with teenagers. If you want to approach teens with respect, but part of the respect is understanding that, that they may think in a different way. And if you have a memory of how you thought as a teenager, you know that this is true. Um, that you have to understand this from a developmental standpoint. And one of the best ways to do that is to do much more listening than talking when you're working with teens because you want to hear it through their point of view. For example, you know, people who are trying to prevent teen pregnancy sometimes went about it by thinking that this was just a birth control issue, an access to birth control issue, and what they discovered when they listened to teens was that many of these pregnancies were not unintended, that there were a host of complex issues that fed into why teens became pregnant. and they had to tailor their strategies to what the teens were actually thinking about and not to their preconceived notions. Um, we've talked about using some of the, the websites like uh, That's Not Cool or Thin Line for the basis of presentations, using experiential learning and using teen-friendly communication like those websites uh, as you do prevention programs is going to go a long way towards having a a really good uh, communication with the young people that you're talking with. And just very briefly, I want to mention that pregnant teens are at very high risk of abuse. Uh, many of them have older partners, which can certainly raise the possibility that there's a coercive relationship. And reproductive coercion may be a part of that abusive relationship so that someone is forced to do something sexually that they don't want, or they may be participating voluntarily in a sexual relationship, but they want to use birth control, and their partner is uh, threatening them or coercing them in some way not to do so. One of the handouts that, that is linked to on your resource sheet is uh, a handout that talks about all the skills and tools that teens need. So I just want you to take a, a quick glance at this list. We're not going to go through all of those, but these are the, the foundational skills that teens need in order to be in healthy relationships. And then underneath each one of those uh, skill, individual skills on the resource sheet, there are links to different uh, resources that will help you to pursue those, those skills and tools and to work with teens to develop those skills. Um, why don't teens seek services from advocacy agencies? There are a lot of reasons, but teens often don't have a way to get there. They may not have a trust in adults because of past relationships. They may have kind of a complica complicated schedule because of school or work or what's going on with their family. They may be afraid of losing confidentiality. And whether or not cost is actually an issue in your agency, they may perceive that. That may be a perceived barrier. So addressing each one of those barriers and thinking of teens when you're talking within your agency of reducing barriers to services, making sure that you include a brainstorming about teenagers, I think is, is really useful. And then this set of uh, strategies came from 
the Seattle King County Family Planning site, and they were talking about medical clinics, but I thought that they were really very helpful thoughts and ideas for how you could make any kind of services more teen-friendly, having special hours that are just for teens, uh, making sure that you target teens in your outreach and that you target all teens, including LGBTQ teens. That's something I want to reiterate also, that that they perceive you as friendly, <laughs> um, that there are... that. You have things in your waiting room, you just don't have good housekeeping magazine in your waiting room, that you have things that might be more appropriate for teens, um, that staff know what teens are about, um, that you follow up when you do prevention presentations, and that you offer teens an opportunity to give feedback. In some places, there are teen advisory councils that work with, or advisory committees that work with advocacy agencies to make sure that they are actually getting the teen perspective as they plan their activities for teens. So we have an opportunity for some questions now. Um, and if you don't get a chance to ask all the questions that you want during this time period, then you will have an opportunity to email me and you see that on your screen. Okay, so are you still <laughs> Trish is helping me to, to figure out the, uh, okay, a question for the end. Can you comment on rape fantasies between two people who, who are teens? Mm, something happened with this, I'm sorry. Um, that may be played out without a safe word in place. For example, a female teen may be actively sexting her partner about acting out a rape fantasy and it actually happening, and during that act, she feels that she's actually being raped. Okay, I'm not sure that I'm really understanding the entire context of this question, but I, I think in terms of trying to assist teens in setting reasonable limits and a context for what they're doing, they have to have that whole framework around consent. And whether it's a, a fantasy game or whether it's any kind of a communication sex scene, that that basic understanding of what's consent and what's respect between the two people is what has to be in place unless uh, in order to prevent one of the the partners from feeling as though they're being taken advantage of, advantage of. Um, I'm not sure exactly what kind of comment you're looking for and that maybe if you could follow up on that that would help me to respond to that a little bit better. Okay, so we have a comment from Kayla Wendell, who says, right now we're holding a teen focus group called Suggest Fest for teens in Lewis County. Cool name. Uh, the goal is to hear from teens on why we aren't getting the victims in the office or the phone calls coming in, and also to get help from teens on what they think the DVSA issues are in their own community and how we can help prevent it. I think that's a terrific idea because Teens are the ones who are going to let you know what services they need, what's going to be teen-friendly, how you can reach out, and what would make them feel comfortable coming in for advocacy services. So what a terrific idea. Okay. Someone else says, can you comment on what follow-up from a presentation would look like? Um, well, for example, one of the things that you know is is recommended is to uh, is to have not just a single presentation but to have a series of presentations or to have an opportunity to come back and talk or if you're giving a presentation you know you all know that when you give any kind of a presentation about sexual assault issues somebody's going to disclose I mean that pretty much happens anytime so to have uh, an opportunity for example for teens to talk privately with the presenter or with a school counselor after a prevention presentation, I think is really, really critical. We have a question. Um, why do you think the women's movement of the 70s did not result in a decrease in sexual violence? Wow. Thanks for giving me the easy questions here, folks. <laughs> I'd like to have more than about 30 seconds to think about that one. Um, I'm not sure that it didn't result in a decrease in sexual violence. One of the things we know about sexual violence is that we're not very good at measuring it and that the way in which we study sexual violence has changed so much 
over the years that I'm not sure that we can get a good comparison between pre-women's movement uh, sexual violence and post-women's movement sexual violence. One of the things I know about is that people weren't talking about sexual violence prior to the women's movement. Um, and there are other changes that have happened in society other than just the changing of the sex roles. I think that's a great question, and I can't really do it justice in this time period, but I'd love to put that question out there for people to think about and to talk about with each other. Okay. Someone says, the word coercion is not necessarily teen-friendly. Do you have any ideas of a different term or a word to help teens understand coercion? That's a great point. That's Janine uh, Devenuti, I hope I pronounced that right, who said that. Uh, Janine, I think that's a very, very good point. I think I'd use the word sexual pressure um, rather than coercion with teens. But once again, this would be a, a wonderful opportunity to have teens help you with the wording, you know, because different areas, different age groups, may respond to different words. So get a teen advisory counselor, reach out in the community, or when you go into a presentation, explain the term coercion and ask them, what do you think would be a good word for that? Okay. Someone said, do you think that honor students or gifted students are at a higher risk due to being very active in school activities? That's a very interesting question. We don't have any research or statistics on that, um, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know that being active in school activities is necessarily a risk factor. I think it actually may be a protective factor in some ways because kids who are active in school activities have a social network very often. Um, they are often able to communicate well with other students, and so there may be some protective factors involved there. Okay. Um, I'm trying to... Okay, uh, look for the questions here. Can you speak about working with teens when they are, quote, unquote, dating a much older person, um, such as a 14-year-old dating a 23-year-old, where the teen continues to feel that they are consenting, but based on age and power differential, it is still sexual assault? This is a really, really common situation, and it's a tough situation to approach in an advocacy position, uh, for example, you know, depending on the age of consent laws, there may be a, a, um, a real issue with that. I think it's important not to argue with the young teen about what the relationship is like, but to listen and to ask the kinds of questions about the freedom to consent that will help a person to think through under what circumstances they're able to consent, under what circumstances they feel that they're in an egalitarian relationship because um, 14 year olds could very well romanticize a relationship with an older person and not understand that the power dynamics may be not conducive to a, a, a level playing field. So having the conversation in terms of questions and in terms of asking and inquiring about different aspects of the relationship tends to be more useful than confronting them head on and saying, you know, that person doesn't care about you, they're just exploiting you, that's not going to get you anywhere. In addition, sometimes having a group of teens discuss this together can provide a reality check for the younger teen. Um, question, can you comment on, excuse me, I'm, the chat is, is running away from me on the screen here. Can you comment on teens' tendency to dismiss or minimize sexual assault when both people are drinking or intoxicated? I get that question all the time. Yes, <laughs> I can comment on that because that happens frequently, obviously. And uh, you can talk about the, the, the consent issues and what it's necessar what's necessary to be there for consent. A person has to be able to think clearly in order to consent. You know, if you talk about why can't a nine-year-old consent? Well, a nine-year-old doesn't have the, the tools and the knowledge to make a, a clear consenting decision. Well, why can't somebody who's drunk consent? Um, they also don't have, at that moment, the tools and the knowledge and the resources to make a clear decision. Um, and I, I think that sexual consent and, al and alcohol, we also have to think about what we call alcohol-facilitated sexual assault or drug-facilitated sexual assault, that sometimes it's not a coincidence that the person 
is drunk or high when the sexual assault takes place, that, that often the perpetrator may actually be feeding that person uh, the drugs or the alcohol in an attempt to minimize their ability to resist the sexual assault and coercion. So differentiating between a situation where two people get drunk and make a bad decision and where one person is grooming the other and is using drugs or alcohol to facilitate a sexual assault, I think, is, is crucial. Um, okay, someone said, do you believe the SOS, celibacy until marriage, I guess that's an abstinence-only kind of uh, approach, contributes to the lack of communication about sexual violence, coercion, and lack of birth control use? Well, as I said earlier, I, I truly believe that um, comprehensive sex education is a very, very important foundation for any kind of conversation about sexual consent. Uh, any adult who has the idea that if we don't talk about sex, kids aren't going to think about it uh, was apparently never a teenager himself or herself. So uh, the, more, the more young people know about their options and the more, they, the more information they have, the better they're going to be able to figure out what they want to do. I think that that's pretty common sense. So, yes, I, I do believe that if you don't include the full range of information in sex education that you're going to have, you're, you're stunting kids' ability to talk about what's going on. And we know that from the adolescent uh, pregnancy figures. Texas, for example, is a state that has mandated abstinence-only sex education, and their teen pregnancy rate is 60 per thousand. Whereas in um, Oregon, they have comprehensive sex education and their rate is 16 per thousand as opposed to 60. So apparently not talking about it didn't work too well in Texas. Um, okay, Sarah Honig says, have you ever encountered a teen who describes some pressure from her boyfriend to have sex, then had sex, feels regret, and now is wondering or thinking she was raped and you thought it did not meet the definition of rape or coercion. How that team feels is what you want to deal with. Um, ultimately, she's going to have to make the decision whether she's going to pursue any kind of legal charges, And but helping her to sort out her experience without imposing your view of what that experience was, I think, is... is what you want to do, um, you weren't there, so you don't know what happened. And her perceptions may change over time, and that doesn't necessarily mean that she was or wasn't raped or sexually coerced. So helping her to sort out what actually happened, and then if the issue is whether she's going to pursue legal charges, then that's a different discussion, that's a different conversation, and that has to do with matching up her perception of what happened with the definition of whether this is something that may be legally chargeable. Um, but most times that's not what the issue is. The issue is that someone feels abused and victimized, and that's what you want to deal with in an advocacy situation or even in a therapy situation. Um, you don't want to talk somebody out of their perception of what happened to them. That, that is not a, a really helpful response, generally speaking. We're out of time now. I'm sorry that I didn't get to all of the questions. You do have my email address, and I would hope that you would email questions to me and be a little patient about my having an opportunity to get back to you about them because we had a really great participation on this webinar, so I'm, I, I'm hoping I'll have questions from you and that uh, it'll take me some time to, to get with you. I'm not sure that I can, you know, get at some of these very, very large questions in a in a really specific way, but I will try to present resources and to have conversation with you if you follow up for questions. Uh, I've really enjoyed doing this with you. I would love to hear your feedback about what's useful and what's not useful. Um, I would like to call your attention, in addition to our resource sheet, there is a wiki that's been developed by the Resource Sharing Project, and we'll send you the link for that as well that has a lot of information about teen dating violence and sexual violence, and I hope that's going to be helpful. You will also uh, receive a, a link to the evaluation for this webinar, and please do 
watch for that and fill that out because that helps us to make these webinars better and to respond to your comments so that we take those evaluations very seriously. they're really important to us.